uh, these guys like uh, who who would be Gary Vaynerchuk is a good idea. And not that he's stupid; he's awesome. But uh, I don't. I'm just not a fan of his some of the things that he says. But they say they talk about failure a lot. Oh, you got to get out there and fail. Failure is a part of success. It's part of the process. You're going to strive. You're going to fail. So everyone goes out and they they start celebrating at their failures. Like they'll contact me really and go. I've lost six thousand dollars, man. I'm on my way. I'm like, dude. <laughs> while failure is a part of the process, it's not the goal. Like yeah. you should be trying to get out of losing money as quickly as possible. You know, you're going to lose some in the beginning, but there's no pride in losing money in this game. There's no pride in failure unless it's a step. You know, so I think it's a real dangerous thing to just say like, get out there and fail. The steps to success is fail, fail, fail. It's like I don't know, man. Get it. They just did like a cross promotion. They just did a JV partnership. He had to make money online, free course. She had a list of poor musicians and they blasted it out. And I took his course and it was a 30 day course on basically SEO. And uh, I made a sale. It took me like 90 days. And I made a $27 sale and I, and I was excited and got hooked. And that was the very, very beginning. And I did that for a few years, making not a lot of money, but enough to make it worth my while. And then I ended up moving. My life was a mess. I was a drunk. I was a musician. I was out of control. I was in a lot of trouble all the time. And I moved to L.A. to kind of change my life. And I didn't have a job when I moved here. And so I focused for the first time ever. I focused on my SEO campaigns 100 percent. And during that first three weeks, I was contacted out of nowhere by an affiliate manager. You know how they, 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 they go look up websites and contact people and go, yeah. hey, I'm Steve from whatever network, and we've got the better payouts. And this, this was the first time I'd ever, and these days I don't even respond to those people. Yeah. But yeah. The, the first time I'd ever seen it, and he, he hit me up out of nowhere. He had found one of my sites in a search engine, and he contacted me and said, hey, I see you're doing dating ads or something, dating blogs, and I wanted to introduce you to some of our offers. And I was perplexed, so I called the dude. We had a conversation. He said, I can help you with your dating offers, or there's this other thing that people are doing. And they're doing, he told me the numbers they were doing, and it was in the tens of thousands of dollars a day revenue. And I was doing like, I was making maybe 3000 a month with, with working all the time for years, and I, this was, I had built this SEO thing. He said, yeah, I've got guys doing like 50K a day. I was like, what? what? Doing what? Like, what do I have to do? And he said, you could either, I could help you expand on what you're doing now, or you could pause what you're doing there. Let me show you this other thing. And we spent the next week or so going over it. And he taught me, he showed me AdWords. He showed me the offers. He, we signed up for the network. And he coached me along the way. And I think within 30 or 60 days, I was the, one of the biggest affiliates they had on their network. It, wow, just, wow. it just clicked with me and it exploded. And I rode the wave for years. Still am riding the wave, really. What network was that? Oh, what were they called? No, I probably, I'm not going to say. No, I won't okay. Say. I mean, mine was Azoogle. I think Azoogle was the first one that I got in, in contact with back in the day. I guess it's no problem. It was They were called Motive. Motive Interactive. Oh, I know Motive. Yeah, yeah. Nice. This was nice. 10 years ago. Nine years ago. So nice. good to hear they're still around. Here, I just noticed something. Do you have a pair of headphones you could slip on? Just because when I talk, I can hear it in your... Yeah. In your see, end here. Uh, I've never done this. This is so cool. And now I feel like I'm on Rogan because uh, where is the uh, input? Well, we'll need some edibles and some caveman coffee. And Hey. Uh, <laughs> all I have to do is walk about three steps that way and we'll be good. Nice. Well, I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, where there are more legal dispensaries than there are Starbucks. They're oh, cool. Yeah, they're yeah. There's like 20 legal dispensaries, like within a kilometer from where I am right now. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weed lover's paradise. Yeah, it's a big deal, man. It's been a game changer for me. Uh, drinking didn't work. Like I said before, I was a straight up lunatic drunk. And uh, I spent maybe 
eight years completely never did anything. And then I tried the legal marijuana on a doctor's recommendation. And it's been a, been a big help for me anyway. So, but I wouldn't do it if it wasn't legal. There's no way in hell I would even bother with it if it wasn't legal, but that's cool. Really? I'm, I'm curious about that just because you wouldn't want to risk that basically with all you've kind of built up and, you know, all that you've, you've come from that place. Now you're, you're here. Like you just wouldn't want to risk the legal implications of the, uh, yeah, it's not oh, worth it. It's, oh, it's just, being able to get high is not worth risking, uh, you know, a ten year jail sentence or something. Yeah, I guess it's for so. real in the states too. It's always in Canada. It's always felt like it's only going to be a slap on the wrist anyway, because I guess it's been decriminalized here for for quite a long time. So uh, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, well, where I come from, I, I, I'm, I'm originally from Oklahoma, and they're still giving people life sentences and you know, 30 years, 20, 20 year sentences for a joint and stuff. So I don't, it's not worth it. So for you move, why, why was the move to LA so important? Was it just sort of, I know people tend to like, it's almost like in our DNA as like settlers, like, you know, to, to go West, to go somewhere else. Like, why was it so important for you to, to, to head West my son and in order to like restart your life? It was a move, a, a, a couple things. It was, my life was a train wreck. I had wrecked my life. Um, I was 34 years old when I, when I left, so I wasn't an, uh, a young guy, really. I had lived a long life and it had gone really badly. And I found myself in a position of either, I didn't know how much longer I would make it in the, in the area I was in. I wanted to clean up my life and change it and moving and getting away from all of the stuff that was around me was the best bet that I had. I was dating a girl that lived here in, uh, Beverly Hills. I was, we were doing a long distance thing. And so, and that was the other side of it. She invited me to move here. I moved here and California just has this vibe. The day I got here, I woke up that first morning and I could breathe in. In Oklahoma, my allergies were really bad and here they didn't bother me. And I started meeting people and everyone was about like this universal energy and this weird art and music. And I was like, this is, this is the greatest place on earth. But it was, yeah, it was really twofold. I was pursuing a relationship. And then uh, even more importantly, I was desperately in need of a change. And I lucked out, man. I got here and within 60 days. I think my, that's when my affiliate stuff exploded. Maybe even 40 days wow. from, from not knowing anything to being a monster, like, like just on top of the whole industry up there at the top. It was crazy. It happened really fast. It was an amazing kind of accidental i wasn't planning it or anything it just went all went boom and my whole life changed in a matter of months and your first your first big hits were in search engine marketing well i was doing seo for making enough to get by yeah um but the big hit came from it was adwords yeah ppc search adwords nice that this was... is in 2008 late okay and the uh and they were much more affiliate friendly back then you could load up a campaign of just about anything, set the budget to a million dollars a day and just let it fly and they would just run it. And uh, these days it, it's much more, you know, it's, it's hard to run kind of uh, affiliate stuff on AdWords. But I loved it. I wrote it hard while it lasted. But that was the first big hit with AdWords. Yeah, for me too. I was I, I came up in the industry as an internal affiliate at Neverbloom. And uh, oh, yeah. my first big win was e-cards, making e-cards work, building little mini sites that were like putting a skin on IAC e-cards, fun cards. And I remember we did 28 grand one day in like on a Valentine's e-card little mini site. And I was like, in order to like play with Google at that time, which I think was around 2007, 2008, we were having to write like blog posts about why e-cards are the best and just, just to like get content into our little mini sites around e-cards. But that rush and this this wasn't even my money. I was making good money at the time, um, but I wasn't. It wasn't my money. It wasn't my money. I was putting on the line. I was an inter- like I say, I was an internal affiliate. But that that rush of hitting the refresh button and just seeing something take off is <laughs> you know maybe I'm still chasing that to some extent with what I'm doing now. We all are. I know exactly what you're talking about, and I have a massively addictive personality. No matter what it is, if, like like pushing F5 and refreshing when I. I to see sales come in that fast you know in the beginning it wasn't tremendously quick but you could refresh and you'd have more clicks and maybe another sale it was just like are you kidding me yeah and then you push it again and 50 more dollars and you're like what i remember in the beginning i used to, i never was had access to the ocean 
So I was working online with Motive, making a little bit of money, you know, a couple hundred bucks a day here and there. I would go out to the beach five days a week. And my favorite thing to do was sit there with my iPhone and they didn't have an app, but I was just logging to their site and I'd sit there on the beach and click refresh and it would go 35 more. And I'm looking around going, no, <laughs> and you get, boom, 70 yeah. more. Yeah. And it just blew in my mind. Here we are nine years later and I've probably refreshed my stats a hundred times today. Like I still do it. It's, yeah. it's one of the most fun parts of the game. We're, Especially when the numbers get crazy. We are we're fully integrated with uh, Slack and Stripe and PayPal. So we're we're selling our Facebook Masterclass and the six week affiliate mastery challenge, which is just about to start. And so we get notified every time a sale comes through. And now I've I've augmented it so that I have a because one of my other, my second big success or one of my other big successes was with Yahoo. It was with Yahoo media buying uh, display media buying. So I got a nice Yahoo. Oh, yeah. I got a Yahoo button that I like to carry around with me that does the old Yahoo kind of as a joke. So every time we get a sale, I'm slamming the Yahoo button and and everyone in the office gets to hear uh, that that glorious cry from the early 2000s that everyone loves so much. Yeah, <laughs> man. I, I I did that for a while. I had a thing set up with ClickBank really really early on before the paid traffic. I was promoting some ClickBank offers. And it would email you every time you made a sale. It's probably making like eight sales a day. And I could apply it. I could put a sound on that email so it would sound like a cash register. Nice. So I'd, I'd be sitting there with my iPhone and I'd hear cha-ching. And I'd just go, oh, my God. You know, and then it would go ba-bing, you know, another 10 minutes later. And you're just thinking, this is insane. But after a while, like everybody I know that's done a cash register sound, once you scale to a super high volume, <laughs> yeah. it, it becomes like the, the novelty wears off because it's like ka-ching, 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 ka-ching yeah. all day long. And people are like, what's wrong with your phone? Like, uh, uh, <laughs> I have an addic not... addictive personality. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 totally. I wanted to, what's the art behind you? I don't know if you've talked about that in your podcast. I just had to ask, what is that? Um, I can't tell you, to be honest. Oh, it's, interesting. Uh, it's some stuff that, uh, that, uh, it's personal. No one, no one is personal. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's no big, it's no big deal. Yeah, it's not yeah. Like, um, Picasso's or anything <laughs> okay. like that. There's some prints of uh, of some amazing art that I just, that I just personally like. Very cool. Um, I, I've got a lot of my uh, grandfather's art in here too. He's he was a painter, uh, an artist, and I have a bunch of his stuff. But behind me is just some prints of some other stuff. Nice. I wanted to you to finish a little bit more about your story. So you got up to the point where you're a super affiliate, uh, just killing it on a bunch of different traffic sources. Then at what point did you decide that you wanted to create your own sort of like, uh, you know, not guru? Because I think of you of like, you're kind of like an anti-guru in a way. Because it's like most of your videos that you even talk about, you're not even really talking about marketing on most of your videos these days. You're just, you're sort of talking about life and and inspirational things and stuff like that. But like, when did you decide that you wanted to, first of all, create Mad Society? Uh, I didn't, it, it was, they, people asked me to build it or I never would have built a form. I had no intention of building a form. Well, let's go back a little bit. Okay. What happened with the, the guru type stuff. The only reason that I do this is like two years ago or whenever it was, I had a blog and no one really read it. I had poetry and my little daily stuff that I was up to. And, you know, 10 people read it a week. Then one day I wrote a, a, a post about affiliate marketing about, uh, how I forget what it was, but I wrote one post and I published it. And I usually, like I said, I got five or 10, maybe 50 views on an article that I would post. And this one went live and I had, uh, I watched it and like midway through the next day, all of a sudden I just had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people viewing this thing. I thought I was under attack. They were all from Asia and I didn't know where this was coming from. I'd never seen it like this. Uh, and then I, it took me about a day to figure it out. And what had happened was uh, Charles No had posted it on his Facebook. And he, he, was, he had a pretty big blog building at that time as well. And he retweeted it and posted it on there. So I had like 900 people from all over the world, you know, Croatia and, and China and, and, and Korea and all these places. And I thought, and like any good addict, I was like, well, okay, a thousand people read this post. Yep. Let's do that again. Like you, I wrote another one. You got any more of that uh, traffic? You got, it's like, yeah. Like, let's see what happens now. And, you know, a bunch of people, uh, maybe like 150 people signed up on my email list a day. 
that I did that. And so I posted another affiliate thing and sure enough, just, boom, it just swarmed and people signed up on my list. And, and then I got hooked on it and I started doing it twice a week. And that went on, that's been going on now for years. It's not as often as I used to, but it just kind of happened by accident and it wasn't planned. I wasn't like going to build, oh, I'm going to start a blog and mm-hmm. make some money with it. I just literally wrote what I was up to that day. Thousand people viewed it. And I just was like, Okay, I just kept doing it. And now it's been uh, two years. And the Mad Society thing was kind of the same. I was doing a Periscope show in the mornings called Morning Coffee with Mail and D, where I just turned on Periscope and talked to whoever showed up. And we ended up, uh, it was mostly about marketing. Yeah, man, coffee cheers. Coffee, water water cheers, hydration cheers, dehydration in my case. That's where all this was on Periscope. It was like, three to five days a week. We were talking about live campaigns. They were asking me questions. We were just having fun. And they, they, at some point they said, we want a place. We need somewhere to hang out when you're not on Periscope. Like I said, I don't know. They said, make a Facebook group. I was like, okay, I made a Facebook group. And you know, a couple hundred people signed up for it instantly. I was like, what is this? And then they wanted me to hang out with them. I said, well, I don't, I don't have time to hang out in there. There's nothing. It's not like, I spend my time on things that make money and this is just, this is fun. Yeah. There's nothing in it for me. And they said, well, charge us. I said, well, what would you guys pay? Like what, what it's, it looks like. They said, well, it would be a forum. We'll pay you whatever a month. They gave me different price ranges. They said, you could post stuff here and then you'll be financially incentivized to hang out with us and, and, and spend time there. And I said, okay, okay. I said, if I build it, will you guys actually sign up? They said, yes, and everybody. And I built it. Uh, one of the guys actually built it for me. One of the people, Darren, if you're watching, this guy, Darren, got a hold of me and said, I'll help you build it. So he built it for me. We, we, we started letting in like five people a week to t- just to make sure it worked. And any time I would allow five people to sign up, like 50 people would sign up. I'm like, what is this? And so slowly it just, we finally opened doors and, you know, several hundred people signed up and it's been running for two years. And I never in my life would have imagined running an affiliate marketing forum, but uh, it kind of just, like I said, it built itself. And it did to some, out of, but the necessity was created by what? Your your transparency, your honesty, like all of the, your, your, your crystal clear radio voice, all of these things. It was just, there was something that people, really drew people to you. Yeah, for sure. I'm definitely different. Like, uh, um, and I've had to, it's a slippery slope doing this kind of, when you talk about affiliate marketing, because everyone goes down the route of, you know, the dry erase board and today's tips for affiliate marketing is number one. Yeah. Here we go. Landing pages, you know, and all this stuff. And for me, like I did slip into that for a few months, but it just wasn't sustainable. I couldn't fake, I couldn't make things up like that on a regular basis. And when the YouTube channel really took off was when I stopped doing, you know, today we're going to talk about how to deal with low ROIs on mobile. When I stopped doing that and didn't prepare at all. And I just turned the camera on no preparation, put the microphone in front of me and was like, Hey, good morning. How you guys doing? You know, here coffee cheers. And we just kind of sit around and talk. When I started doing that, like my my subscribers started growing five times as fast. Like instead of getting 10 a day, I'd start getting 50. Yeah. I, was like, I think I figured it out. I just talk. Sometimes it's about affiliate marketing. Sometimes it's not. And then in, in the forum, people tell me where they found me is one of the things I like to know. Like, how did you even get here? And a lot of them now say YouTube, like your YouTube marketing is really working. I'm like, well, I'm not marketing. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm just talking and it seems to work. But yeah, people like, uh, I think the industry needs a real voice. They need some to see that, like I tell people when I lose money, I tell people about the bad times. Yeah. Because way too many people just show sports cars yeah. and these freaking beach series with feet up, like I'm just living the dream. Yeah. And they're not. Nine, nine times out of 10, these guys have never done anything of significance. And the only money that they've ever made is by selling courses to new people who don't understand. There's very few, like 1% of the people that talk about affiliate marketing actually have done anything with it. The rest are just pretenders. And so 
there's another like like my name checks out. You can ask around. No one, there's no debate on whether whether I'm for real or not. And, and not to brag, I'm just saying, yeah. ask anyone. Ask anyone that's been in the industry for the last ten years, and they can show you screenshots of numbers or whatever. And uh, I think it's important to have some real people talking about. It because, like I said, most of it's garbage. There's you know Jason's great. Jason Akatir, yep. Charles knows for real. Yep. Uh, all the guys from Stack That Money are. They've all done incredible things. It's all legit, but. It's the weird little side bloggers, you know, or the people, the guys on YouTube that are, you know, older dudes with cheap headphones and you can see their house is falling apart in the background. And <laughs> they're, they're selling this million dollar system. And the like, system, dude. right? Yeah. It, it's funny. Yeah, when, we, yeah. when we did our webinar for the last six week AMC, I had someone come in to like, who'd done a lot of webinars before and talk to me about it. And I showed them the script and he's like, in this script, you know, when you talk here, he's like, you're going to tell people that they're going to lose money. And you're going to, you, you say that way too much in this webinar. And I like, it was a highly successful webinar. We ended up selling a lot of seats for the six week AMC, but I think we probably said over 10 times now, like now remember when you start affiliate marketing, you're going to lose money. Like you're going to, and it's just like, I bet that is sort of like an anti webinar in that sense, because, and that's something we try to do in iStack training is really walk that line, let people know that this isn't a system for money making. This is, these are skills that you can build on over time and, and you can, you can make a lot of money with it if you, if you really put yourself into it, but it's not just, it's not a, a check the box system that has you making money at the end of it. Yeah. And that's what everyone really is dying to see. That's why ads like one weird trick works so well, because everyone wants the, the blueprint, the shortcut. The, the special secret sauce, my yeah. private system that I've used for years. And like you said, it does, like there are systems that work and the money that's being made is real, but in the beginning, you will lose money. Like I lost three grand my first month. And the best part of that is what I tell people is you're definitely going to lose money, maybe even all of it. But the reason it's not because it's a scam or because it doesn't work. It's because you suck at affiliate marketing yeah. right now. And you're going to suck until you, you know, spend some time and, and put some money in the game and learn some lessons. And that could take 30, 60, 90 days yep. at minimum. And you can speed that uh, up. It's going to be. I was going to say, you can speed that up by joining Mad Society, joining STM, taking one of the courses. Like these are ways that you can, there are ways you can speed up that learning curve, which is important yeah. to note. But the thing is, you're, you still have to go through all that stuff yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, working with a mentor or someone legit, like a lot of mentors are even worse. Like they're charging people ten, fifteen thousand dollars to work with them and they don't teach them. They confuse people and that's their game. But uh, uh, Stack That Money, there, when I started, there was no resource like Stack That Money or Mad Society or App Playbook or anything like that. You were on your own. You know, it was like you and if an affiliate manager wouldn't help you, you were screwed if you yeah. didn't have friends. But, but yeah, the forums can definitely shortcut you. But there's still going to be that period where you launch, even if I posted my exact campaign that I'm running right now, that's, let's say it's making $1,000 a day, yeah. even if you launch it, you're going to lose money on it in the beginning because there's, there's no, you can't, you can't just copy and paste something and make it work immediately. If it's weird like that. It's almost like there's a weird magic in three people can launch the same campaign the same day. Two of them fail miserably and one for some reason makes all the money. It's a very strange thing that I've seen many, many times, but you will lose money. Yeah. Uh, one, people have to know that. And they do. And, and but that you're not going to hear that from all the Ferrari drivers out there. That's not part of their, their sales pitch, which is why they probably have a wider funnel, a wider and like, but, but a shorter customer life cycle maybe, or something they don't, cause people get disillusioned and they bounce out or whatever. But that's something we're trying to walk with. Cause we want to Affiliate media buying, like your your whole in, your intro where you talked about coming from SEO into affiliate media buying, where you sort of decided, okay, I'm going to force the issue. I want to have to stop relying on people to come to properties and build stuff up over time. I want to buy traffic and really, you know, force the issue. As I say, this is what I talked with Lorenzo about last week. Um, and it's just, yeah, like it, it allows you to, to accelerate your learnings that much quicker, um, but it also accelerates the risk for, for potential losing as well. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, the SEO thing is, is safe. It's hard to lose. All you lose is time, but you lose a lot of time. And the, the potential upside is so small. Like, I, I don't know anyone who's built a multi-million dollar SEO business in the last uh, half a decade or decade. Maybe they're out there. I don't know any of them. Yeah. And if they do, 
if you do scale SEO, it's usually so black hat that it's short lived, you know? Yeah. So with this stuff, yeah, you can't force the issue, but you will lose money fast as well <laughs> for sure but that's good coin. too because sometimes yeah you, you every dollar you lose is like another lesson learned and so you shouldn't race out and this is important you should not race out and try to lose money because you know everybody's so stupid uh these guys like uh who who would be gary vaynerchuk is a good idea and not that he's stupid he's awesome but uh i don't i'm just not a fan of his some of the things that he says but they say they talk about failure a lot Oh, you got to get out there and fail. Failure is a part of success. It's part of the process. You're going to strive. You're going to fail. So everyone goes out and they, they start celebrating at their failures. Like they'll contact me really and go, I've lost $6,000, man. I'm on my way. I'm like, dude, <laughs> while failure is a part of the process, it's not the goal. Like yeah. you should be trying to get out of losing money as quickly as possible you know, you're going to lose some in the beginning, but there's no pride in losing money in this game. There's no pride in failure unless it's a step, you know? So I think it's a real dangerous thing to just say like, get out there and fail. The steps to success is fail, fail, fail. It's like, I don't know, man. But yeah. The, think so. the whole Vanier check thing with, it's all it, the grind, right? Like you've got to, you're not, you're, you're not winning unless you're working yourself to death more or less. Like, that that whole oh, yeah. idea is is a little bit difficult to swallow. Like uh, I don't know if it's a West Coast thing, but like work life balance. You know, I'm working my ass off in what I'm doing now, but but work life balance is a, is is a very important thing, and and that's obviously I got a kid too, so that's something that I'm uh, hyper focused about. But yeah, that I, there are so, some of those higher end gurus. Him and uh, Grant Cardone is someone that's like I remember I saw an infomercial with him where he's just like every time you were out having a drink with a buddy. I was grinding and I, you know, all of this stuff. And I'm like, uh, great. I don't know. I don't know if that's for me. Yeah. I don't know anything. I watched like just a part of Grant Cardone one time and wasn't my thing, but Gary's entertaining. Yeah. But yeah, he does, he does push the basically, uh, exhaustion route, which is true. I mean, in the beginning, I'd say I worked 18 hours a day for the first six months. Wow. Like I slept maybe six hours. And I slept with a laptop in my bed and I was just so enveloped in the whole thing. Like I was obsessed. And I, when new, I think you do, there is a point where you can slack off, but in the beginning you really have to go crazy yeah. and put in those hard hours. But long term you'll burn yourself out and fall apart. And you look at some of these guys that promote the exhaust yourself to success lifestyle and they don't look good. <laughs> Their face is pale. Yeah. You know, maybe their hair starts falling out. They're putting on weight or something. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if that's what I want to do. You know, good for you, man. Yeah. Enjoy your your fifth Ferrari or whatever it is you're going for. But uh, it's not the route I take these days anyway. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up here, this is, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know Paul J. Paul, but he's one of uh, one of my close friends and he's, he's uh He's, we, we've been working with him on a couple of things. He, he met you at, at one event and, and, and was chatting with you. And he said the one thing, one of the things he likes about you and your affiliate marketing uh, sort of background is you've made a lot of random shit work. He said, he said that there's a lot, you're, you're good at like, cause it's like when you look at, a, at an affiliate network, they have a hundred offers or something like that, but they have like, you know, they have only five or something that, that are really driving the bulk of the money. But he said that you've right. had in your in your experience in, in what he knew of you is that you've been able to take things you've been that first mover on some things where where you know you you tried a new thing and you and you found a way to work make it work is that first of all is that true would you do you own up to that uh, description as someone who goes out there and tries new things and and then how, what do you have to say about that? Well, it's a weird it's a weird thing because yeah I've I've done some things. Uh, that were original ideas. And even if they weren't original, I was with the guy who we were kind of talking about it and came up with a concept. Maybe it was his idea. Maybe I innovated on his idea, but I've been a first mover in some time, in some cases, but not all the cases, but I'll say like, I'd say 20% of the time are they're, they're brand new ideas, 80% I'm following everybody else okay. and then just innovating and make it better. But that being said, that 20% of original ideas that I came up with, probably made the 80% of the money. Like the, the ideas that, that no one thought of exploded so big and, and transformed the industry in a way that almost to this day, if I go online and, and click through on ads, in, in 2017, 
I still see my images and, and graphics that I made on on people's landing pages. These are things I made in 2008. Yeah. Nine years later, the banner ads or you know or whatever the graphic, the blinking button, it's still on people's websites. It's the funniest thing. But yeah, man. So the original ideas are way harder to to make them work because they're just not proven. But when you can make them work, when I've made them work, they've been bombs bombs go off like unbelievable type of stuff yeah but that, the rest of the time is just you know doing the, the normal find what's working launch that and try to make it better and then i'll scale those things into oblivion <laughs> but it seems like it's worth people's if nothing else just because the thing is that 20 percent that you created ends up being 80 percent of what other people try as well because they'll fast follow you and and copy it as well so we need these prime movers so I think I think it behooves yeah. affiliates out there to be like to spend some of their time really trying to be original. Like that's not a lot of the messages. Just figure out what's working and replicate it. But there's got to be some effort put into into thinking outside the box and creating shit, or the industry's going to stagnate. Yeah, the, and it's where the most money is. Like when you come up. Yeah. And I've read a story about a guy that came up with the uh, the survey lander. Okay. Or no, it was one of the sweepstakes, the original sweepstakes lander in like 2007. He came up with it. And and I and I was able to. This is another thing. He was able to run it in obscurity, like no one knew about it. It takes about three or four months for people to catch on. And he talked about how his numbers went from losing a little bit to making five hundred a day to five thousand to twenty five thousand. And then when you scale it that big, everyone sees what you're doing, copies it, and they flood the market copying your campaign. And you can feel the numbers go. They're going up, and you can just feel it kind of go boom, boom, watered down. Boom. Starts to get weird. You're like, what's going on? And then you look around the web, and everyone's running your page or your your ads, and you go, oh no, they got me. You know, but that that grace period of about ninety to one hundred and twenty days when no one knows what you're doing, those are some those. That's what the dreams are, are made of, man. <laughs> nice. But I forget where I read that. It was either in Stack That Money or on a uh, Wicked Fire or something way back in the day. Hmm. But it's, it's a good time. And that's the downside is when people see what you're doing, they will copy it. We that's, all do it's it. It's sort of inevitable, right? Like in you yourself, like 80% yeah. of what you're doing is building on what other affiliates. It's sort of it's sort of understood, I think, in the space to some extent. But it doesn't stop it from sucking when you see you know, that stuff being every way. Even back to my e-cards example, I, I have a friend of mine here in town who became a friend later who used to leave comments on our blogs to be like, well, you know, our e-cards blogs be like, hey, good idea. Don't mind if I do. And like, he'd literally like leave a comment. And then I knew that that, that we were going to see a clone of our site up a little bit later. And uh, right now this comes to me when I, when I go out there and I look at the courses we're putting on and I see, this is actually totally different, but I see all the pirates out there who are pirating uh, the courses that we create and all the places that you can get oh. our courses for 90% <laughs> discounts, huge lore. I'm talking to you. Uh, we're, we're, get us off of there. But uh, but yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. a very interesting space because it's still in some sense it's still the wild west. There's still this you know you can totally just kind of jump on board and, and copy people. But at the same time, you're not going to really succeed until you can create something original. You're not like you're not going to get to those really high levels unless you can kind of innovate. As I think. Yeah, and innovation is is the key word. There's a there's a friend told me a long time ago. He said the money's not in invention; it's in innovation like the person who comes up with the idea never makes as much money as the guy who takes that idea and then innovates it yeah and uh i notice that all the time like you know back in the day you could copy and paste the campaign and have a pretty good chance of making money but these days what i do is i'll copy someone else's campaign and this is good advice for anyone i'll copy the campaign and all it is is a baseline for me to operate against so if i launch the campaign and i see that they're Airflow has a 50 cent EPC or whatever. Then my my job is to work against it, start changing things, but use it as a as a bar. Yeah, you know, so my job is just to beat the bar. So I'll only use their page, their images, or their headline or whatever until I come up with what beats it, and then I'll try to beat that. Then I'll try to. So by the end, it's completely different than what I started with, uh, and then people start stealing that idea from me. Here's another thing. Once I get it to the point to where it's dominating the original and 700 people steal the best version that I have and they start running it, I don't even get mad because what I'll do is I, I sometimes get an alert that such and such domain is using your page. You can set up scripts to tell you. And then I'll just put them on a watch list 
and you can I can monitor their domains to see when they change my page. Ah. <laughs> and when I get an when I get an alert that says they've changed something, like let's say they have a new headline, I'll just take the headline, put it on my page, split test it, and many many thousand times, theirs will blow mine out of the water. Nice. So yeah, they left, they stole it from me, and it pissed me off. But they ended up being like, I use them like employees. They're my split testers now, and I watch them. And if they put new images. I get an email that says new images has been added to whatever.com. I'll go grab it, stick it on my page and go, Hey, that's an extra 400 bucks a day. Thank you, sir. Or whoever you are. It's inverted ad spying. Yeah. So they're my, they're my employees. And I've been in that situation where I I innovated a new lander and it was taken by literally hundreds of people (laughs) all at once. It blew up and uh, I got really mad. But after that experience, it taught me like, okay, What's the script that'll tell you if someone jacks your lander? Okay, let me put that on. Nice. Now let me set this up to email me, and you can get kind of innovative with it. So when they steal it, instead of getting pissed off, you go, sweet, another one, another split test it. Nice. You know? So what do you think this is – what do you think is, is the – like, are, you know, everyone talks about e-commerce these days. Everyone's, a lot of people are jumping on Facebook. What's your personal stance on, on sort of like where you're going to be putting your energies in in the in the coming months in affiliate marketing? Are you trying to break into the e-commerce game, or are you really focused on on whatever you've been traditionally running? I'm not focused on it at all. I thought about it uh, in the, like a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. People started talking about it. Some of my friends are are the biggest guys in that space now. But I learned a lesson a long time ago, and that is for me to stick with what I'm good at, and what I'm really good at is running traffic. And creating customers for less money than I get paid by the for, for yeah, that's what I'm good at. I jumped off. Actually, no one knows this, but in the very, very beginning, I, in, I was doing SEO. I uh, was running an ebook, and okay. it was doing really well. I copied the product, changed the name, came up with my own version of it, and started promoting it. But unfortunately, it was too close to the original, and they shut me down. But I tried running my own product way back in the day. And then maybe 2010, I became a product owner. I stopped doing affiliate stuff. I built my own version of the product that I was running traffic for. And I tried that for a year. I spent a year working on it. And I think I broke about even for the whole year. Oh, wow. And it was a disaster. I didn't have any fun. I was on the phone with banks. I was talking to shipping warehouses and you know, post offices and all this crap. And it just didn't interest me at all. I went back to doing CPA arbitrage marketing and and everything exploded again. And it just taught me a lesson. Like no matter what people are doing, um, I don't care. Like I know what I'm good at. And as long as it's still working, I'm just going to continue doing it. The downside is you can't, you know, you hear a lot of these e-commerce guys talk about building a business that they can sell someday and you can't sell at a, a CPA marketing person's, I don't even have a team or anything. So you do miss out on that side of it, like the exit side where the huge money's at, but I don't even care. I have, I make more money right now and and it's all good. Uh, I haven't, but as far as e-commerce, I haven't done any of it yet. I was there when it started, like the first flashlight campaign. Oh yeah. I was one of the first, first affiliates to run it. And that, that basically created that whole industry. So I have run those offers, but I've never built one. Interesting. And yeah, I was just listening to your podcast um, about Johnny Depp. About about how about it's not about how much money you make; it's how much money you keep as well, right? That's that's <laughs> the metric that matters the most. It is mind-boggling yeah. to think how Johnny Depp has spent that much money. Or Mike Tyson, your story about Mike Tyson and his Vegas trips, uh, all these peak experiences. That's sort of my next question. I wanted to get in a little bit about about your lifestyle and and that's something that you kind of put on display a little bit in some of your in some of your podcasts one thing i'd like an update on your closet i'd like to know whether whether your closet (laughs) minimalism has maintained because you 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 took us on a tour uh, on on your on your podcast of the way your closet was you had like eight t-shirts or like one pair of jeans and and this idea of it's something my wife and i are going through right now we've got a kid and so we've just brought so much stuff into the house uh, so many games, so many plastic things. I'm kind of bad, but like I buy clothes and, 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 you know, my closet is just this ever, ever growing thing. So I'm interested in, in, in sort of applying some of these minimalist techniques, but I'm interested to hear from you whether, whether you've maintained this sort of minimalist approach. I've sort of maintained it. That, the, 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 that video is hilarious because 
I just heard about this thing called uh, whatever it was, the condo something, Mary yeah. Condo. Yeah. And and I did a video about it, not knowing that it was a massive trend happening in the world. That video, my videos usually get about a thousand, fifteen hundred plays. That video has like a hundred and fifteen thousand views. I saw that because people are so into it. And uh, I showed my closet. I went through the system and did it. If I showed it to you now, it looks exactly the same, but that I did hang up some uh, some pants and shirts and stuff. So okay. instead of just the four fold, folded items of clothing and using her special folding method, I did go back to, uh, I have some sweaters and sweatshirts and things hung in the closet. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. The thing I didn't tell anyone in that video was that I took everything and just put it in another closet. So that <laughs> other closet. That other closet does still exist. Okay. I literally haven't used I maybe pulled two things out of there in the last year. Yeah. And so at some point it's all going to go, but for now it's, it's still there. It's, in the I, closet. But I it's, have a, it's got, it's got I have a two closet system too, basically where I put a bunch of stuff that I, cause it's, but I, but then I, but what I'm trying to do is then go through that second closet, like, and I'd be like, have I touched this in a year? If I haven't touched it in a year, then, then it's gone kind of thing. That's the key. Like if you want to minimize, minimize your life and live more of a minimal lifestyle, you do exactly that. Like with a, with a desk, I've seen situations, I read an article where, and I did this with my desk, you take everything off the desk, everything, there's nothing on the desk, and then you think, what do I need? And you, and you slowly, as you need it, you bring things back, like, okay, I'm going to need a laptop, right? So you have your laptop, yep. and then maybe you want a mouse, but only if you need it, not, not that you might use it in the future. If you're missing the mouse, then you bring, you, you go to the box, you take the mouse, and you put it there. And if that's it, that's it. But, you know, if you need, if you go, OK, I need a pencil and a piece of paper desperately. OK, now that's going to be here. But you only bring back things as they're needed. You'll be surprised, man, like 80 percent of the things on your desk, you won't even bring back. You're like, why did I have that cactus? Why did I have that Superman toy? Yeah. Why was there a, a, a magnifying glass? A Yahoo button. You know, <laughs> you know I, <laughs> I, had a, I had a Yahoo button. <laughs> Purple and, Yahoo like, button. I had seven sets of headphones and, yeah. and all these cables and. It's a cool experiment. Just take everything, put it in a box, and then bring it back as needed. You can do that with your kitchen, with your bedroom, with your bathroom, whatever. And you'll be surprised at how many things stay in the box. And you just at some point throw them away or donate them. And I think and, you, yeah, like it's. I look at I look at our closets, and it's like we don't touch, we don't go into our closets hardly. They've just become these static, like stacks of shit that we don't use. And it's like I, we we've talked about like moving into a new house, and it's like why would we move into a house when we're not using you are not even properly like engaging and using the space that we have so i think it's a really interesting thing uh for people to to be conscious of right and i think affiliate marketers in general are, are people that are they're sort of outside the box thinkers they're living sort of non-standard professional lives uh and so i, I imagine it's something that are that, that that people think about uh and it's cool that your video caught that trend it's funny when i watched that video this afternoon i just saw a thousand other videos on the side each all about this specific minimalist thing yeah uh, so that was, in, I wonder if you converted any of those into, uh, into affiliate uh, affiliates. I had to have, because the subscriber rate went through the roof. Everyone that watched that video subscribed and it went on and on. I could, the first day it had like 6,000 views and then I would hit refresh and it'd, it'd go seven. I'm like, what is happening? But yeah, I picked up a lot of followers and people, uh, people from that, but it's mainly, uh, mainly women and mainly people interested in minimalism. So it didn't really like back out at the mad society yeah. forum or anything like that. But I think one thing to bring up too uh, about affiliate marketing and this stuff is when affiliate, you know, affiliate marketers can make way more money than they're used to, you know, uh, way more money than doctors and attorneys and stuff. And what happens in the beginning, I see, I've seen it happen a lot. People will make tremendous amounts of money. They start buying stuff because it feels good, especially if you were broke as a child. And when you were growing up, like I was, it feels fantastic to be able to buy like a Rolex or a Ferrari yeah. and you start thinking about oh my God, <laughs> Tesla I X. I need a Bentley Tesla yeah. helicopter, you know, all these things. And I went through that phase and I bought some Louis Vuitton crap and some Dol uh, Dolce Gabbana bags and some things. So I bought a bunch of clothes. You just thousands and thousands and thousands of Your clothes. Versace thought, shirts. Yeah. It was going to make me feel good. Yeah. I actually had some Versace shirts. I remember man. you talked about those. <laughs> that, that I don't have them anymore. But what I ended up doing was I ended up giving most of that stuff away, put it in a trash bag and put it on Craigslist and just gave it to a guy and he was ecstatic. But what I learned was um, 
that the buying things, that's why everyone has so much stuff is because we're trying to make ourselves happy. And you keep thinking you can buy. If I had new MacBook with the cool toolbar on yeah. there, man, my life would be great. Then you get it and you go, okay, my life still sucks. Maybe I need a Ferrari, you know? And then you get a Ferrari and you're happy for like two days. And then you're in the Ferrari, like wanting to blow your brains out. And you start to realize that, that all these things that you're buying and that we stick in our closets and in storage shelters and like all these places, they don't do anything for you. They, they don't make you, they make you happy for a minute and then yeah. you feel like an idiot. I did anyway. So I, I think you're going to complete your ego everything. in some way, right? Like, oh, I need a new pair of shoes for fall. Yeah. I was just in a shoe store looking at a new pair of Nikes. I got a pro I got an issue with shoes. And I'm like, oh, I don't have a, this kind of Nike. And that once I put that into my repertoire, it'll really like, really do what? Like, what, what will it really, what will someone notice? Like, oh, he's got those shoes versus those shoes. Like, how does that make your life any better, really? You know? It's, it's stupid. I, I carried that Louis Vuitton bag and threw it through an uh, airport one time. And it had wheels on it, you know, on a suitcase. And I was so embarrassed. For some reason, it just made me feel terrible, like an idiot. And I, 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 I never used it on a flight again. Plus, it was so expensive. I was terrified to let them check it. Yeah. I'm like this bag, this bag costs more than your car. Yeah. Like you're gonna, you're gonna take it. You know they're gonna throw it, and so you're so scared. These days, you know what I use now? I went to Walmart and I got like a nineteen dollars suitcase. Nice. And when it breaks in half, I'll go get another one and just use that. Yeah. And I don't really care. I, just, I think you go. You go through that phase. Everyone goes through that phase when they get a couple extra bucks. You yeah. Blow it. And, but at the same time, I think it is, there are some things that you do want good shit for. You know, you, you, you do want to have, like, instead of buying a lot of shitty things, it's maybe sometimes better to buy one quality something, you know? Or am I deluding yeah. myself in that? No, no, no. I, but the delusion, I think, and, and an ex-girlfriend told me this, she wants everything a little bit of time. So why does that have to be a little bit of time? She said, oh, because the craftsmanship, it lasts so much longer. It's just not like there's great, well, very well made, cheaper stuff that you can buy. But I did, I do think like when I made a, uh, my first big haul or whatever, I was able to pay off my crappy little car and get a new nice BMW car that, that, I've, that I've driven now for eight years. And I got a nicer place to live. So there's these, there are these certain things like, oh, of course you want to upgrade. You don't want to have a crappy computer and yeah. you're making $4 million a year, you know? So that there's no shame in going out and getting a new MacBook Pro and stuff. But it's when you see the guys with the, the Rolex, Rolex on each arm, yeah. the diamonds here, diamonds there. They're doing bottle service everywhere. Yeah. And number one, to me, that says I see an unhappy person who's, who's like really trying to fill a hole left by their parents or something, not loving them or not being around. And then um, number two, they go broke. Like yeah. you see those guys who really start spending like crazy immediately. They're all back at jobs now, man. I've seen guys that were making a million, two million dollars a year in 2008 and 2009. And then you, you talk to them now and they live in an apartment in, in you know, Alaska or somewhere and they're working at an oil field. And you're like, what happened? They spent it all. Yeah. You know? Right. Louis Vuitton, man. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I wanted to, this kind of leads into my next thing I wanted to talk about, which is, uh, you know, we, I like to end, end these things by talking a little bit about peak experiences and like why people are, you know, you're, you have an addicted personality. You're addicted to winning a little bit. You're addicted to like the winning feeling you get when you make campaigns work. Uh, but like, why do you do it? Like, what is it that affiliate marketing grants you? What, like, what do you do with your freedom that really like fulfills you or gives, even if it is just that dopamine hit, like, what is it that, that you're sort of after in life? Oh, this is a, that's a tough one. I, let me say that this is the first thing that popped into my head is the reason I was so focused on it in the beginning. And I'm going to be real honest with you here. This isn't going to be honest. I needed something to transfix my crazy brain on so that I could stay sober mm. in a weird way. Like I would, I was newly sober, lived here, didn't know anybody. And the affiliate marketing game and all the numbers and stats and the pushing of the buttons it really just controlled my crazy brain at first. You know, that's why I was able to sit in a room for 16 hours a day or what, 18 hours a day and do it. So that was the first thing that it gave me was just a, and when I'm working, it's almost like a meditation. That's why I like doing the work myself. I don't want to hire people to do it because when I'm working on these numbers, it sucks your whole mind into it. You, you're not really thinking about other things. You could get drawn into the thing. Yeah. And it's like a meditation. So instead of me worrying about, 
you know, what am I going to do with, I should have done this in high school. Why didn't I, you know, do this thing in life? Instead of that, that drives me crazy and makes you want to drink booze to block it all out. I just get on the computer and I'm like in my world, you know, and in my stats, I'm not thinking about anything. And I go to sleep and I made it through another day. So originally that was the big payoff. You know, the, the money was fun too, but the, it, it afforded me a freedom of my, from my own mind That's interesting. for the, the first year or so that I was trying to stay off of the booze. But the other thing is the, uh, it's the freedom. I hate, let me just say this, and this is going to be truthful too. If I had a, to work a nine to five job now, and I had been, and this had never happened, I would have blown my brains out by now, man. I don't think I could handle it. I, I, even mm -hmm. fun jobs like 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 the marketing jobs and agencies, working for my friends, making a bunch of money. Yeah, I hated it, man. I hated it. It just does not work for me to have to put on a, a, a an outfit and go to a place for eight hours and, and do that. It, for me, this it's given me the freedom. Number one, I get to be myself every day. I get to wear whatever I want. I don't have to report to anyone for any reason, for anything. And, and even if it wasn't making a bunch of money, I'd still do it. Even if I was broke, if I could do this and get by, yeah. I would. Because the freedom, there's no underestimating the freedom of getting to be yourself all the time. And you don't realize it until you make that transformation. Like yeah. when I look back, I'm like, how did I even go to that place and, and work and go to meetings and all this stuff? When you pull yourself out, you, you don't realize it at first, but you just feel this big weight lifted off like, wait a minute, if I want to tattoo my face with puzzle pieces, <laughs> I, I could do it. You know, if I want to wear drag, if I want to put on a dress and walk around in high heels, I could do it. Yeah. And, and no, no one can tell me I can't. And, and you, so I was just going to say, you give some examples there that are that are extreme, but I also, after watching your videos, yeah. you're a bit of a life hacker. You're someone who likes to be able to say, okay, what happens when I get up at four and start working? Or, or what happens if I get up? Like, it seems like, like, as, like you really earn the, the ability to do whatever the fuck you want with your life. And you're someone who uses that as well. You've hacked your life in all sorts of ways by quitting booze, by jumping onto this and that. So I see it being sort of essential to your origin as well is that you, you need this ability to, to experiment with what's really going to work for you. Yeah, yeah, and as far as like origin story goes, like my my dream was always to be a rock star, and the, and the but the real thing was I just wanted freedom. I yeah. wanted to be able. To, I didn't want to have to do anything so like like wear a put on an Arby's uniform or something like. Or I worked at Subway for a couple of years. Uh, that just didn't fit for Sandwich me. Sandwich so artist, it, it perfect. Yeah, and when you when you free yourself up from the job, from having a job because working a job is like ninety percent of your life, man. You're there most of the time. Yeah. And when you don't have to do that anymore, then you get to start having fun, like sleep hacking. And let me see what happens when I wake up at 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. Or what if I take a nap at 1 and wake up at 3 and then go back to sleep at 4 and then get stoned at 5. And then I, you know, I go for a walk at 6. You get to program your life into whatever works for you. And you can't do that with a job because when you're, when you're working a job, you only really have between the hours of, what, 5 and 11 to be you? Yeah. Maybe 6 and 11 if you get home a little later. You get like five hours a day to try to be yourself. Uh, so it's nice to have all that time. And yeah, why not use it, man? I've, I've tested every element of my life and I still do, you know? Mm -hmm. You said you used to be one and wanted to be a rock star, but I don't think that's true. I think, because I've seen more and more of your music pop up onto your YouTube feed and you are, you're an active rocker, right? Like you, you have a band, you play in music. Is that, would you consider that like one of your peak experiences? Is that one of the places that you're happiest, like on stage performing? 100%. And what I realized is uh, when I was broke and I was a kid, I read an article, I think it was Madonna, said something like, no one should play music unless they have to. And to me, that meant it made sense to me because, you know, why should some guy from a really well-to-do family and a rich kid from a rich family, why should he play music? He's taken the spot of someone who can't do anything else, who has no, no other option. And I lived my whole life by that rule. And then when I made a bunch of money, I kind of reconsidered like, well, I don't need to play music anymore. But then, as the years went by, that hole grew bigger and bigger, and I realized I had the wrong definition of the word need. Mm. And instead of needing the, the money or the stardom or whatever, it's just the need to play and to sing and to record and, and, and just be an artist in that way. 
And so over the last three years or so, it's really started to pick at me like, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing any music? And so if when I say I used to want to be a rock star, I still do. I guarantee you, if I were to tell you honestly, it's still the I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm delusional, but it's still my my major push in life. It's the thing I want to do the most. And yeah, I've been tinkering, tinkering around with music again, been writing with a guy every week here recently, and it's starting to flood its way back into the mix. But yeah, used to want to be is not truthful. Still want to be. I just was interrupted in my past, luckily, by affiliate marketing. By great success. Gave me, <laughs> yeah. Gave, yeah, yeah. It gave me all the freedom I wanted, uh, but none of the, the release of playing music, I guess I should say. But yeah, man, music is still a part of my life, 100%. Love it. M- music is one of those things. I grew up in. A, I grew up in a boys' choir. This is ridiculous. But all through like grade two, s- yeah, too. I was in a boys' yeah. choir, and like I remember seeing the Hallelujah chorus in a church in Montreal, <laughs> and it was. I'm not. I'm not a, uh, a Christian person necessarily, uh, but it had this deep sense of like spiritual oneness of being like having these perfect acoustics and having fifty people all singing precise notes and the way it was composed and. It was great, and I haven't like I don't have I listen to music incessantly. I'm a huge audiophile, but I I don't I don't perform it or I don't I don't and I find myself whistling and thinking about it all the time. Like I gotta get I gotta just start figuring out uh, some Ableton and I just throw in some tracks down, just starting to to experiment with it because I think I think that could really be a fulfilling aspect of, of of the creative aspect of my life. How old were you when you did that? I was in grade. Uh, my biggest were in, in grade six, seven, and eight. Those were so I was like fourteen or you know thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, yeah. And that sound when everyone sings together. I used to. I was in choir in school, and when that sound of everyone singing together, I would tear up, man, many yeah. times. Just like wow, it's so yeah. magical. I couldn't imagine what it was like in a big church like that. I bet it sounded amazing. It was amazing. There, there actually is, and I haven't been able to find the time because I, I have a, I have a, I do a lot of, sp- I like sports, so I do I spend a lot of my evenings or my fr- few free evenings doing sports. But there's a local choir here for adults, and I'm, and they sing like the Smiths, and they sing like oh, they cool. sing really cool shit. So I really want to. I think I'm gonna this year, this winter, I might, uh, I might join the choir and and see if I can recapture some of that singing glory. You should do it, man. Just go I up will. there, put your robe on, and hallelujah. <laughs> no matter what they're singing, I'll just sing hallelujah in a robe. Well, and... I've, seen, I've seen some choir directors and like high school band directors now that are giving the kids hip music. They'll do like a, a Black Sabbath song on xylophones and, and the marching band nice. or the choral, the choir, instead of singing hallelujah or whatever, they'll do a Lady Gaga song you know, or something cool. So there's some cool stuff going on with it. But yeah, man, singing, singing with a group is uh is almost like an out-of-body experience it makes your whole body tingle and there's something really i don't know ancient and kind of magic about it just people's voices singing together in these weird notes that go together you know it's like whoa and if you get out of it it sounds terrible but if you go back it sounds perfect magical man that's cool you did that i didn't have any idea yeah so affiliate marketers out there let's all join a choir when we get to when we get together in bangkok we'll sing the we'll sing some lady gaga it's gonna be huge uh, Malin, yeah, thank man. you so much for doing this today. I really appreciate it. People want to get in touch with you. They're going to, first of all, go to your, your YouTube. Check out Malin Darris on YouTube. Uh, his content's just amazing. Uh, Mad Society, That's what's the, the URL on Mad Society? It's madsociety.net. And we just did all the social profiles launched yesterday. So you can go to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and they're all Mad Society Net. One word, Mad nice. Society Net. Yeah, man. And we're gonna have to do. I gotta do something in LA because I gotta. We gotta find a way to involve you in some way. And I know you don't. You're not a huge fan of traveling long distances. I'm going to Moscow on Monday for the first time, which is like a 20 oh. hour flight for a six day trip. It's kind of like a bucket list thing. I want to go check out Moscow. I'm excited about it, but I'm not. It's good. It, that takes that takes a couple months off your life, probably that that sort of trip. You know, that's brutal to travel. Someone just invited me to speak in Asia. And I said, Are you kidding me? Like, you want me to fly to Asia, do a speech, and then fly home? Like. How many millions of dollars I was talking about here? Because that's how you're out of your mind. I know the but guy if, you who know, invited I'm, you. <laughs> I'm not a travel guy. I'm not a travel guy, but maybe someday I will. Maybe okay. if I take sleeping pills in a plane or something. I just got good my luck prescription. With Moscow trip. Oh, cool. See, you're a wise, you're a wise human being. I need those. Get on the plane, fall asleep for 20 hours, and wake up in Moscow. That's what I'm gonna do. But before I will find a way to get out, get, get out and visit you because I think I think I'd love to hang out sometime and uh, hit up one of those shops and, and and maybe we could lay down a few tracks. Yeah, man, you come to LA, I'm game. But 
I'm not going to Asia to hang out. <laughs> no okay. <way. laughs> That's, that sounds like a deal. I'll, I'm going to take you up on that. Yeah, man. Cool. Okay. Thanks again. All right, brother. Thank you. Bye.